transactions are free. I'll repeat that again, something you will never hear again from a banker. All transaction charges are free. I'm looking forward to this morning. We've uh, seen a, a preliminary overview of the, of the pitches, some exciting stuff. Uh, I don't want to plot spoil, uh, so looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Rob, uh, Emery, CEO of Roca, give us a few words. Hello, young people. My name is Emery Rubagenga. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm CEO of a mining company called Roca, but I'm also involved in several other investments. And I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. I believe this is where we can transform Africa with the help of our leaders, but it lies, the future lies in our hands. So it's a great privilege to be here. I can't wait to hear from the youngsters uh, in a few minutes. And I encourage all the young people here in the room to do business because that's how we're going to transform our continent. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene, you're probably one of the most active investors in the startup here. So please tell us a bit about that. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm managing gorillas. And uh, today, I mean business. There is no lottery. There is no free money. Every single coin I invest in a business means a return. So you better be ready to convince me to invest in a business. I've been losing money for a while, and I've stopped losing money. So I need a return. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, for setting the tone well. Uh, so we have notary businesses from all over Africa, uh, Angola, Mozambique, Nigeria, Rwanda. And we will start with Ericsson from uh, Tupaca coming to us from Angola, I believe, for the second time. Ericsson, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me start off with a quick fact. Today is Tupuka's second year anniversary. Two years ago, we started. And now we are a company that are employing over 140 people. So, can I please have the switch for the slides, please? The so this is my second time, so I'm, I have a couple of familiar faces. Okay, can you please have the slides up? So, this is Tupuka. Today, people have struggled, are struggling a lot because of lack of time. People are rushing everywhere. We want things quick, we want information now. Just the thought of, uh, just the thought of uh, uh, staying in line, looking for uh, meals, or going grocery shop, looking for uh, medicine, it's really frustrating. If you compile all this, uh, uh, all these things, you put it together, imagine how much money vendors are losing every single day because of this need of uh, convenience. So we created Tupuka, an all-in-one delivery platform that allows users to order from multiple vendors straight from one smartphone. I'm talking about restaurant, grocery shops, pharmacy, you can book tickets, and recently you can now order from a formal market using our application. In two years of operation, like I said, we have accomplished some interesting things. Uh, recently, we just broke uh, uh, in sales more than uh, uh, half a million dollars. We have a net revenue of 100, uh, more than $100,000. We're employing over 150 uh, uh, young Angolans, and we have delivered over uh, 160,000 uh, deliveries. We are named the best startup in Angola. We're considered one of the most promising growing startups in Africa by Tech uh, Disrupt Africa. If we look at the numbers, this, we are accomplishing this thing with only reaching like a half a percent of our current market. In Luanda, there is about seven, people, uh, seven million people living there. And uh, people that are condition of using our platform, there's, there's about 1.5 million people. And we're just serving uh, 5,000 monthly active users and we're doing over half a million dollars in sales. 
Our solution is pretty simple. People download the application, the vendor receives the order through the order that a cu customer makes, and once they declare ready for delivery, our dispatch assigns it to the closest available driver. One interesting thing is we don't own any bikes. We're allowing young people that have motorcycles to join our platform and connecting them with other people that have motorcycles uh, so they can uh, get a, a work. Our revenue model is fairly simple. We make money from commissions, delivery fees, and recently we just added uh, uh, advertising. Our unit economics, we're making about $1.13 cents, uh, $1.13 uh, uh, for each uh, order that we make. So this is something really unique because uh, most of the startup on this uh, sector, they're not able to reach this number. But by adding several uh, services within one platform, we're able to reach this thing. If you look at the marketing strategy, we're focusing primarily on digital, but uh, we see opportunity of cross-marketing with several vendors that we have. If we have a point of sale or advertising on each store, it means like we have more contact for the customer to get a, be aware of our solution. For growth strategy, we're partnering with small delivery companies and taxi companies to be able to expand to areas that we're not delivering. We're enabling a uh, takeout option throughout the country so people they can build up the awareness of the application. Once we feel there's enough tr uh, traffic, we deploy the deliveries. Our team is uh, very diverse. We come from different backgrounds, educated in the United States. We have uh, co-founders that actually uh, deploy the delivery business in the United States. Recently, we just completed an uh, uh, acceleration process with uh, Seedstar that helped us really refine our business. We have investors and advisors that are following us throughout our, st our, our, our steps and making sure that we're making the best decisions. With the success that Tupuka has been having, uh, there has been coming up small delivery companies trying to replicate the same thing that we're doing. But how we uh, phase off these competitions by having exclusive contract with our vendors. We have multiple services that allow us to have a, a, a different range so we can offer our vendors different price to kill off the, the competition and we're leading the market in uh, on-demand delivery. Right now, we're raising about $3 million in order to accelerate growth and expand throughout a a Angola and uh, uh, invest in uh, customer experience and R&D. And most of the funds will be used on marketing in order to drive up uh, the customer acquisition rapidly. Right now, our goal is to deliver anything anywhere by having a platform that can serve anyone uh, that has access to our platform. So thank you. Thank you, Ericsson. We met in May. Yes. Um, I'm curious on the progress since, because we've seen that. So what happened since May? Uh, since May, we happened to deploy actually the grocery and pharmacies. And uh, we're testing out uh, uh, selling tickets as well. So uh, there has been a really a high uh, uh, learning curve. Uh, because uh, we're adding different, different verticals using the same oper operating team. So we managed to launch those things successfully, and we're in the process of uh, improving the platform so we can be able to add more vendors because of a certain feature that we're missing. Okay. And the unit economics improved since then? Uh, yes, it improved because, of, uh, for example, for the morning drivers that don't have many deliveries, we're able to now to do like <coughs> carrier services in order to maximize the time on the field. Okay, and um, back then we looked, you were profitable. Yes. Where are you today with financing? Uh, we are still profitable, but we're using uh, all the funds that we're getting to in order to reinvest on uh, improving training the people because the challenge here is tremendous because we have to prepare people to, able to be able to manage multiple verticals instead of just focusing on one. So uh, human uh, capital is really important in order to secure this. Gorillas, any questions? Robin? Um, quick question. Yes. The platform that you're running, yes. who developed it? What's the background behind the platform? So uh, our platform is developed by a, a South African company that we partner with. Uh, we're using, uh, we just recently bought a, de a dispatching platform that's owned by us. And uh, in the near future, we're looking towards uh, uh, having an internal developing team. Uh, in order to continue accelerating the, the platform. We're using Python uh, language to, to, uh, as a background for our, our tech, uh, tech uh, platform. So it's not pr proprietary? No, it's pr proprietary. It's proprietary. It, it belongs to us. Okay. Then I've got another question for you. Yeah. In terms of the tech delivery and the, the logistics stroke services, 
that you offer? Are you tech or logics and logistics and services? And I'm asking that question because we're sitting in Rwanda, you're in Angola. Is this model scalable? Because mm -hmm. your tech is, is scalable, that's transferable across the countries, but your log logistics and your knowledge of the local market is key to your success in Angola. So uh, that's how we position ourselves like that. So we can have a part of our business that we can scale. For example, last time I was here, I was offered uh, to come in Rwanda because the way that we're running things is really interesting. But uh, logistics in Africa, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, lack of uh, proper addresses and all those stuff, like we can transfer it here and we can create actually processes that minimize the effort for whoever wants to take our solution elsewhere. And the log logistical part is really interesting because one of the major troubles that it, uh, it's uh, in Africa is moving things. Whenever like we're developing unit things, but whenever it comes to connecting them, that's where the trouble is. So we want to continue specializing on this thing. And uh, as w meanwhile we're doing this thing, we want to continue adding different verticals because we're moving things from one point to the other. So those two components is really important for our business model. So we can deploy whatever, whatever feels comfortable for whatever market. So the investment that you're looking for, how much is going towards uh, rolling out additional, uh, your connectivity? I saw a uh, number of 50% going to marketing and sales. Yeah. Um, but you're having to look at developing, and isn't that going to be costing money to the, to the company? Uh, developing. Uh, with 20% uh, that is equivalent to almost a, a, a million, uh, that's enough to have an in-house developing team. Uh, so we can have a sustainable model where whenever we're franchising a model, if that's the case, our developing team is always in-house instead of outsourcing to third parties. So a uh, good, good part of the money is going to the developing team so we can start having this support like on real time. Thank you. Uh, would you look for purely finance or strategic partnership can be considered? Uh, right now we're looking for everything because uh, we got to this point by combining uh, these two uh, facts. For example, our first Asia investor, uh, the first two ones, one came with uh, the capital, another one was well connected, uh, had a restaurant, knew all the restaurant owners and is an Indian, knows about sales. So that allow us to really maximize. We're not looking just purely on the financial, uh, on the money part. We're looking on the strategy in order to continue refining our business as we go forward. Williams, is that your name, Williams? No, Ericsson, Vesey. Ericsson, sorry. So you're trying to raise $5 million? Yes. Do you think this is the right place to raise $5 million? Uh, this is the right place to announce that we're raising $5 million. Yes. So, my question is, yeah. I saw you went to Switzerland. Yes. You were able to raise about $200,000. That's it. Is that correct? Uh, three hundred and $340,000. That's what you've raised so far? Uh, no, so far since we started, we raised about uh, $700,000. Yeah. So, imagine I give you $5 million today. Yeah. Um, am I buying you out? No. Would you provide me for $5 million? Uh, a good exit strategy within three years where you can uh, exit with uh, twice as the value that you're putting now. How are you going to raise $10 million within five years from now? I'm sorry? Three years. I'm going to raise $10 million. Let's say I'm getting out after three years. Yeah. What's my return on that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't hear What's it. my return for $5 million? What's my return on investment? Your return on investment is about $9 million uh in uh 2021 because uh one of the area, one of the possible way of uh growing the business and exiting is through acquisition of major players such as rock internet and uh, deliver uh, hero so our goal is really to maximize whenever they consider en entering the angolan market they have a solid uh comp competition over there so they think about acquiring and then a second option is by uh, angolan stock exchange which we're already like in contact in order to start having the roadmap because uh, since we're leading the market in, uh, as a tech startup, there's a really huge interest for them to start having like that portfolio as well. So we're working together with them to see how can we maximize that, those end results. Well, 
I'm still not yet convinced. Remember last year when you were in town, I asked you, how are you different between Tupuka and Jumia? It was, as far as I know, Jumia is not making money at all, and they're quite bigger than you guys. So yeah. How can you convince me to invest in you, Tupuka, then in Jumia? You saw our unit of economics. Uh, on each delivery we're making, we're making money. So uh, that's something particular what we're doing because we're not just pure food delivery. We're maximizing with grocery delivery. The same guy that is delivering food uh, then gets to deliver like a grocery that has a higher delivery fee. Uh, so we're maximizing, we're adding on top. So meaning like the same cost of operation by adding multiple services, I can make more money on top of that. So it's just a creative way of thinking of how to, how to run this process. So let's make it simple. Can you share with me your um, business plan, your financial projections? I can, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to show you after this thing, after Perfect. this. So let's talk maybe after this session. I just want to have a look and make sure that your business is really profitable. Sure. Thank you. I want to go back to what Eugene said. So you said exit. Somebody will buy you out. Have you had uh, conversation? Do you know if they're interested in the Angola market? What will they be looking for? How would you need to look like for them to be interested? Uh, we need to look bigger than we are right now. That's why we're raising funds in order to accelerate. So for us, it's like instead of growing organically, which just gives uh, more validation for the other players to come in and like uh, just uh, burn like the customer acquisition, our goal right now is to take over the market and just start having like uh, our uh, franchising some of our tech to other markets so we can continue increasing the valuation of the of the company so our goal right now is like I said is continue increasing the share of the market as the uh, leading uh, service on in Angola but have you spoken to the ones that you think will uh, buy you? I spoken to Naspers uh, one month ago uh, we have good solid leads uh, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, offers for finders agreement because whenever people look at our financial, look at how we're operating, it's really interesting. I'm talking about 5,000 monthly active users that are in sales generating over half a million dollars. So uh, if you take that number, it's just correlated to 20,000, you can see the volume of business that is available over there. And plus, we're developing a lot of uh, other expertise, such as logistics. For example, right now, it's uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, we're connecting even the informal market to the formal market by just having an aggregator. So, so we were getting really crafty on ways of how we can maximize. And that's how really where the value of Tupuka comes in. So we look at every single uh, business around the world and we're taking the best uh, what they're doing and we're applying it and having a success formula for somebody to come in, eventually buy or we become too big and we start buying other guys. Okay, gorillas. What's your, uh, what's your verdict? Robin? I think I'm, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I'm uh, interested more in the scalability because I'm, uh, I'm here in East Africa and we want to see if it's, uh, if it's transferable, especially with on the tech side. So it'd be nice to have a conversation with regards to that, uh, the transferability of the, of the tech solution and uh, how that does to the, to the business. And then once again, in absence of financials, we'd need to have a chat. So the same question as was raised earlier um, with regards to uh, having a look at the financials. One, one interesting thing that uh, we just recently tapped into, uh, I'm sh pretty sure there's an informal market here. Imagine like uh, an informal market acting like a vendor. So let's just replicate a grocery store. You have the tomatoes, uh, onions, whatever. You, so you submit the order through Tupuka, and we have an aggregator at the, uh, the, at the informal market going there and collecting the best uh, product and delivering. So that's something that hasn't been done in Africa uh, and something that we're actually developing and studying. So the R&D part is really the, the part that is really interesting about Tupuka because uh, we can deploy solutions within a week, try a different business model and see if it's working or not. So this flexibility, that's something really interesting to consider. Interesting to look at. We've had similar, uh, similar home deliveries on, uh, from direct from the market in Rwanda already, given it's an innovative country. 
um, but it'll be good to see uh, your version of the uh, and the logistics behind it. Okay. Yeah, congratulations for your ambition. I've, I felt uh, it's extremely ambitious to have this kind of figure, but like other gorillas, I felt also that maybe the amounts we are talking about here are not reflecting in in um, in the figures that we have in front of us. Um, so I'll pass. Thank you. Can I have a look in your business plan and projection, financial projection? Yeah, sure. Then I reserve my feedback to you after our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like you. I liked you when we came in May. I think we almost had a deal there. We didn't close. Um, I'd like to have a look. I'll join Eugene when we look at the business and see how that. For us, what will be important is East yeah, Africa and Rwanda on your growth plan. When, how, and what would it take? Okay. We actually have a roadshow to provide all this information for interested investors. Thank you. Thank you, Ericsson. Next one, I'm inviting Federico for EM Prego coming from Mozambique. Good morning, Rwanda. Hi, I'm Federico, and I'm the co-founder of Emprego.co.mz, the largest online job board in Mozambique. So I guess we spend too much time saying that there's a scarcity of talent in Africa. What we fail to mention is that there's even less job opportunities, and the dissemination of these job opportunities is made in a fairly poor way. So to give you a bit of context, uh, this is where we play a role. We understood that um, traditional media is becoming obsolete. There's a declining audience, high advertising costs, and also uh, it's not adequate for job search. On the other end, the existing job boards in Africa, they are either global leaders or they replicate the same approach, meaning they're data heavy, they're slow, and they cater for tech proficient audience. Our solution really caters for emerging markets. We uh, have high performance in low bandwidth environments. We understand that internet is still being massified in Africa, so we have a, a, a specific user interface uh, for that user type. When we launched, we experienced exponential growth, and it didn't take too long for companies to start complaining of how many uh, job applications they were getting through their email box. Our response to that was to launch, uh, a, to launch a software as a service component that not only allows companies to receive applications through our platform, but also allow them to filter candidates according to specific criteria. Not only they can do that, but they can also head on by having access to our talent pool base, where we crowdsource the ratings from HR professionals. The market in Africa is worth around $300 million, and this is excluding the Maghreb region, which is dominated by France and Middle East, and also excluding Ethiopia, which is a very closed market. We took it a step further, and we also removed Nigeria and South Africa as the highly competitive markets that require high investment. So we're looking at a $50 million market. Our business model is rooted on a social entrepreneurial approach. We charge value-added services in recruitment and advertising to large companies so we can afford to give it for free to candidates, small enterprises, charities, and public academic institutions. In recruitment, our packages go from $100 for a single job posting to $600 for a monthly uh, package uh, to access to our talent pool base. In advertising, we sell our banners for $100 up to $350 for contextual banners in high rotation. So far, we've engaged more than 500 paying customers. We have more than 115,000 registered candidates and we've posted more than 12,000 job opportunities in Mozambique alone. If you're looking at our traction, you can see steady growth from the beginning. We've been around for six years, 
and you can notice that this year we doubled our daily users um, due to the, the integration of a smart newsletter that caters for particular candidates' interests. The revenues, they follow the same pattern, and we doubled the revenues last year as we created a new revenue stream. As you can see, we've been hurt by the currency fluctuations of our country, yet we still made $700,000 in the past six years. This made us very eager to expand, and we already have a presence in Angola and uh, in Greece, where we, we have a, a white label solution. Now we're willing to expand it to an additional four countries and have a Pan-African presence. When we compare to our competitors, we see that at times they have a too sophisticated technology which is not really uh, locally relevant. We understand, we understand that we have a mar better market fit, we have an innovative design that contributes for the ease of use, and we have an inclusive business model that uh, also in, uh, addresses the SME market. I am a former country manager at LG Electronics. My co-founder and CTO, Janice, has been approached by fake Facebook and turned them down to get on this journey with us. And Tiago has acted as an, a, a consultant for the World Bank, and he's our R&D officer. This is the team that works behind the scenes to get Emprego to have the level, uh, the, this, the global standards that it has today. We're looking for $400,000 for 15% equity in our business, in a holding in Mauritius. Thank you. Right on time, five minutes exactly. Well done, well rehearsed. Well, uh, Ericsson step, uh, put the bar too high. I'm, I must say that I was, and we sh and we should go <laughs> it was high. a tough one. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I uh, looked at the Mozambique market and you are a market leader, so that's, that's good to see. Uh, gorillas, Robin, would you want to start? Um, you mentioned in, in terms of your current clients, you have 500 clients, 500 we've active, had, they, we've had 500 that are paying 500, or is that 500 uh, and some of them are uh, annuity and some of them are one-offs? No, so basically, as I said, we, our packages go from a prepaid, which is for a single job posting, to uh, a contract where they have unlimited job postings and they pay uh, a fee. And to the access to the talent pool base. So these are three types of contracts. Um, within this 500, we're talking about within six years, we've had over 500 companies paying for our services. Okay, what's your, what does your annuity revenue scheme look like at the moment? So how many are contractually bound to you, uh, excluding the, the one-offs? So, so those current that are, are contractually bound now in terms of- Currently, we only, have, we only have 14 companies on a contract basis. A lot of companies, especially NGOs, they work on project basis and they're not comfortable in signing a contract. So uh, actually, uh, the, the, let's say the marginal profit that we get on that is better because they, they end up paying more than if they had a contract. And that's uh, 500, you said $500 a month? So Five, no, $600 a month is for the access to our talent uh, database. All right. Yeah. A hundred dollars is for a single job posting. Okay. And then two hundred and fifty dollars is a contract for unlimited postings. All right. And in, uh, in Mozambique, you have uh, currently uh, subscribers in terms of job seekers. You said 115,000, is that correct? Right now, we have 115,000 registered candidates. Okay. How many placements have you made? Uh, over the last, say, within the last 12 months, how many placements? So that, that's, that's quite an interesting question. We are just now starting to have uh, that kind of feedback. Basically, companies were not comfortable in, in allowing us to know whether or not they've hired. So we created a dialogue within the platform that we're about to launch, where um, similarly to, to classified jobs, uh, classified websites, when they actually get the candidate, they just mention that they got the candidate. We, we cannot know which candidate, but then we can give feedback to the, to the candidates, which is also uh, an ongoing issue with recruitment agencies, for instance. Most of candidates don't get feedback whether or not they got only the ones that are selected for the recruitment process. So you don't really know out of those 115 what the, the placement... So we're actually not charging on placement, but 
for in terms of social impact, it's important for us to 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 track that, and we're starting to do it now. And then part of that uh, free service that you were giving, what how what did what of a how much of a drain is that in terms of those the the people that are your subscribers, job seekers? How much of it? What of your job seekers? How many you've got? Uh, you're giving it uh, free service to. Uh, NGOs, so, go, uh, government institutions. We, we don't. We don't give a free service to NGOs. Uh, we give it to public academic institutions and uh, and charities, not NGOs. So where there's voluntary work. Why that's important is, you know, in a capitalist world, cash is king. Online content is king, and basically we can generate content that's exclusive to us by doing this. So it makes commercial sense, although we're trying to empower these institutions. Yes, I'm interested to know if you'd be considering an investment up to 51% of your company. I think everything is negotiable in life. Yes, I'm, I'm a shareholder in a company called ITM Africa, uh, which does exactly the same. And we, we are now in Angola and we are thinking of uh, coming in Mozambique. But the vision would be a kind of a takeover, and then we will be called ITM Africa. <laughs> so if you take 51% of my business, uh, the valuation can never be the same. No, of course, we will have the calculations. Sure. I, I, we need to, to talk to the shareholders, sure. to, to the other partners. But exactly. is it something that you would consider? That's something I would consider. Thank you. Now, let's talk figures now. We're talking about 400,000 for 15%, right? Sure. Yet, in the last six years, you have made 700,000. Yes, but the first two years, we were just validating the business model and really tweaking the product. So uh, I would say most of the revenues came after the version 2 was launched, which was uh, in 1st of May, International Labor Day, 2014, in our second, uh, second anniversary. So what is your current valuation of our, your company? Our current valuation is $2.5 million. Okay. Then I would like us to, to, to proceed the conversation after this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene, the, the bar is going high. No, I think the game is over. I leave it to ITM Africa. Thank you. <laughs> so you know what? I'd like to use the opportunity for something else. Robin, Eugene, now go on his shoes and tell him what he needs to consider when he gets uh, this kind of acquisition offer. What, if you receive it, what, what are the important things for you when he discusses it with Omri? I have a question. You know, everything depends on the offer and demand. Exactly. How do you make sure that people offering jobs match the, those guys who are seeking jobs? This is a question so about your business sustainability. That, that's an interesting question. When we started, uh, we were just a facilitator between uh, recruiters and candidates, and we didn't really change the way they were recruiting. So the email was still the channel, right? Then when we figured out that companies were getting too many emails, my geek co-founders were happy, I was concerned. Uh, some servers started going down. And then we understood that we needed to develop the software as a service solution. So we became part of the pre-selection process, right? Which we weren't before. We offer uh, filters to the company so that they can do them th themselves. Now we are in a phase that we need to start being very careful on how we <coughs> deliver the right candidates. Because companies already see us as the standard and they want the next innovation to come. We're doing two things. One, we are now going from pre-selection to the interview phase. We're, go we're developing a tool that allows recruiters to rate the candidates as they are interviewing them. And by doing this, we are actually crowdsourcing all of this information so that we can rate our candidates. The second thing we're doing is we're looking at uh, artificial intelligence to be able to start predicting patterns. So, of course, in the beginning, it's not going to give as much. 
but then as data grows, it starts predicting which, which is the right candidate for which company. Thank you, that's good, Vadiohead. I think we reached an uh, interesting thing, so I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing back on how the discussion with Omri go. Um, sure. Well done, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, a last one, last question, may I? Sure. Yeah, um, would you mind a third party kind of audit to, to just verify the figures? Uh, not at all. We actually um, we audited by Deloitte every year, uh, and this year we're uh, being audited by tech services as well. <laughs> not a pleasant news, <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't mind. Wonderful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming from Nigeria, Joyce for Oriki, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone, and hello, gorillas. My name is Joyce Awoshika, and I'm from Nigeria. I am the founder of Oriki, and today I'm seeking $250,000 in exchange for 10% equity in my company. Oriki is a Nigerian word. It's native to the, the Yoruba tribe, and it means your heritage, your crown, and your inspiration. At Oriki, we design products to give women skin for them to also make women and men look handsome and beautiful by using only the best all natural ingredients sourced from the richest resource continent in the world, Africa. From a young age, I fell in love with the power of all natural. At the age of 12, I mixed an avocado, yogurt, and olive oil together to make a mask for my hair. The result was a well-moisturized, softer, and more lustrous mane. Since then, Experimenting with raw materials and natural resources became a form of self-expression. It also powered my journey back to my Nigerian roots and ultimately helped me in creating the Oriki brand. Gorillas, did you know that some of the biggest beauty brands and retailers around the world feature African ingredients? But without enlightening consumers like you and I, we often don't realize that we're using it. Well, with Oriki, African beauty is no longer a hidden secret. The global beauty industry is worth $450 billion. And at Oriki, we believe that African beauty is the next big player in the US, Europe, and globally. Gorillas, I know you're ambitious people. You're often busy. You are dealing with the pressures of being the strongest and most intelligent primates in the jungle. So today I decided to bring a little bit of inspiration into your day and onto your faces. And so I have some samples here for you. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to grab them. First, I would like to discuss three of our products out of our product range of 30. First up is our banana and pineapple enzymatic exfoliant. This two-in-one exfoliant and mask is packed with tropical fruits and botanical extracts that essentially moisturize your skin. It's quick and efficient, on-the-go skincare, and of course, the moisturizing banana is quite apt for you gorillas. Next up, we have our ancient African beauty secret. How many of us here know about black soap? Well, our black soap is not just the normal black soap. We infuse it with turmeric, grown in Africa, raw honey, cocoa pods, and plantain, and it helps heal the skin. The skin Africans are often praised for as being anti-aging. Last but not least is our next, the next generation of shea butter. Our own version is called the whip souffle version. And in Africa, we coin it as women's gold. It's a farm to skin product that is not just good for your skin, but also for your body and your hair. At Ariki, promoting indigenous industry is extremely critical to us. We value knowing where our ingredients come from. We value knowing the farmers who grow them, and we value the human hands that connect the value chain from plants to profit. In just under three years, Oriki has two product stores, two spas. We distribute with the largest Nigerian beauty retailer in seven of their stores and growing with them. 
We have a presence in three countries and we have 30 products. Our success is not just measured by the numbers, but also by creating jobs and building a sustainable ecosystem. So gorillas, I would love for you to join me on this journey in making the world a more beautiful place and to leaving a piece of Africa with every beauty consumer around the world. Gorillas, are you with me? Let's turn A Beauty from hyper niche into mainstream. Come join me. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation, and it's always good to bring uh, samples. It gets everybody there. Uh, gorillas, what do you think? Eugene, as a beauty expert. This is a new business to me. I'm not in you know, beauty or fashion business so far, but we are in business in Nigeria, in financial technology, and we're buying out some local financial institutions. I may be willing to look at your financial projections. But quickly, I want to know how much money you want to raise so far. Right. How much have we raised so far? Yes, and how, how do you need from here? How much do you need from here? Right. So initially, our seed capital, we did a friends and family round. We raised about $200,000. Um, we are just under three years old. And at this point right now, we have orders and requests from hotels, airlines. We're also B2B that we cannot fulfill. And so we're looking for capital in the amount of 250000 to focus on distribution, scaling our distribution model. We are in Australia, we're in the US, and we're in Nigeria. But right now, we have order requests from Ghana, South Africa, and the countries are nameless. And so we're looking for that capital to help in two things, the distribution aspect and also marketing. We've grown completely organically since we've started. And now it's time to actually take advantage of digital marketing, influencer marketing, and get Oriki's name out globally. Great. I will put you in touch with my partner in Nigeria so we can look at it. This is something which is feasible. It sounds great, promising business. Thank you. Very impressive. Very impressive and encouraging to see a young uh, African bringing product that will soon compete with uh, L'Oreal, I guess. Yes. That's the plan. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not into beauty neither, but uh, I just wanted to know, this 200,000, uh, what is the breakdown of what will you do and, and what it gives uh, in terms of equity to, to the investor joining you? Right. So I'm raising 250,000, and that is for 10% equity in the company. What it will do, it will allow us to fulfill orders that we currently, so far we've consistently put every dime that we've earned back into the company. And at this point, for example, Q4, we had an opportunity with a big distributor in the UK, and to fill, fulfill that order, we need capital. So 70% of it, we want to go towards distribution, fulfilling orders, working with a contract manufacturer on the continent. And then the rest of it, 30%, would go towards marketing or wiki in very specific channels that would help also bring more presence to the brand. So, so this is the money you need is you have an order, you have everything to do, you just need the capital. We have several it. orders, yes. We just need the capital. Because that's a different form of financing. That's not necessarily equity. Right, but we are actually trying to build the distribution channel. So it's not just that order specifically, but actually to scale. So for example, once we do that first order with the UK that I gave, we now become a distributor with them and we can move on to the others and that's what we want to use the money for. Robin, um, that sort of financing, order back financing, what's the best way to do that? I think that it's true in terms of building scale, uh, raising equity, but that can also be done on a working capital to finance basis as well, especially if you have a good order from a reputable, reputable company uh, in the UK. I got an, another question, just uh, help me out here, and you spoke about contract manufacturer. I remember uh, uh, reading something in the, in, in the write-up that, uh, that I had on the company that you were, you know, it's farm to, farm to the face. So I love the concept. Um, do you, in terms of that uh, value chain, do you, uh, are you vertically integrated? Or do you have supplies, you found supplies? Just let us understand that process 
and then how you, because you're talking distribution, which is obviously the key to this product is getting it into the market. But just uh, uh, help us through the, the, that, that supply chain because that speaks to the, your working capital requirements as well within your company. Yeah. That's a very great question. Um, essentially, when we started, we contract manufactured with a foreign laboratory. And the mission and vision is Africa for us. And so we began to make some of our products locally. And that, those are the, some of them. The three that I highlighted for you are all made on ground in Nigeria. So currently, we have, we've vertically integrated for some of our products where we actually know the co-op and the farmers that grow them. They come straight to our factory and we manufacture them. And then with others, we actually have suppliers that we use. We actually have a laboratory that puts everything together and makes our product with our formula for us. And that's the one that's based in Nigeria? Right. So from a percentage point of view, what percentage um, is, is, in, is Nigeria and what percentage are manufactured outside of Nigeria? Currently, right now, our percentages are 40% Nigeria and 60% out, and we're fastly trying to reverse that. And this uh, money that you're raising now is to expand what? The, be able to pay the contract manufacturer, create your own manufacturer? Right, to be able to... Uh, s set up a lab? Right, so the 250,000 specifically is to be able to work with the manufacturers and be able to make more products and therefore distribute to the distributors that are ask, actually requesting for orders right now. Okay. You're in two outlets, two spas, uh, seven... Um, Retail stores. Seven retail them. stores, yeah. and you and you're exporting. Yes. To Australia, and the U.S. And the U.S. The distributor in Florida. And you're turning over. Last year we did two hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars, and this year, year to date, we're at three hundred and one thousand dollars. And projected by the end of the year. By the end of the year, we project about five hundred thousand, and next year, if we are able to fulfill some of these orders, we're talking millions. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that we're B2B, so we have, we just signed our first, first hotel deal. We are now in a hotel in Nigeria. It's actually the biggest hotel, and we're actually fastly moving out. We have an offer in South Africa and one in Ghana as well, so trying to really pull out, push out the B2B angle of this as well. Spas, hotels, airlines. I don't mean, I don't want to get personal now, but what does your bank balance look like? My background? Your bank balance. <laughs> Can I answer that off the stage? <laughs> it's healthy. <laughs> so you're not borrowing funds. That's We've what never, we have not borrowed funds. You've not borrowed funds. We've not borrowed funds. I think there's an element in there for you to look for outside of the equity, to look at uh, if you get someone to understand your working capital cycle, that you'd be able to raise some money, which means you wouldn't be given away a portion of your company. You'd be able to get it uh, yourself. So you, there's space for both, both debt as well as... Uh, I completely agree with you. And, and even in the banks in Nigeria, their interest rate is 27%, even if you have a PO. But beyond that, we're actually looking for equity partners on the strategic side as well. So if we can get two in one, an equity partner that believes in us, that will finance, and then also be a strategic partner to help us get into various countries and with different channels, that's a win-win for us. Your revenue is in dollars or in... Uh, yeah. Dollars. I, I dollars. converted it so to dollars, basically. But your revenues from the orders are in dollars, so yes. the borrowing rate will, Form, be, yes. will be in dollars rather than local, so that's a different interest rate. Yes. Uh, okay, verdict, gorillas? Okay, I, it's Nigerian based. I, I'm unfortunately, uh, I'm out because I can't, uh, it, we need to be looking at uh, East Africa. However, I can talk to you afterwards. Uh, a friend of mine runs one of the largest banks in Nigeria, and I can put you, at least make an introduction. Thank you. I'm afraid I'll, I'll do the same. I'm thinking of uh, a friend of uh, Yariv and myself who's uh, uh, a banker in Canada and uh, a, a specific bank working in developing countries. Uh, it's called FinDev. I believe uh, this would talk to, to his heart and th there might be some opportunities there. So instead of uh, giving away your equity, maybe like Robin was saying, you'll keep everything and then get uh, a little boost from, from a banker. 
to Al Paz. Yeah, as, as I said, my friend and partner Ekechi is based in Lagos. I will ask to get in touch with you. Hopefully, Robin and myself are not in competition. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Competition is good, I think. Uh, thank you very much. This is fantastic. The trend you're going on is great. Um, the business sounds extremely good. I'm happy to have a conversation afterwards, get a bit more information, and help you, uh, uh, and help you moving forward. Thank you. Next, I'm inviting uh, Yusuf from Bag Innovation from here in Rwanda. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yusuf. And I'm the co-founder and head of operations at Bag Innovation. Here on my side is um, Dina, working with our student relations. First of all, unfortunately, Bag Innovation, we do not sell innovative bags. We are a youth consultancy agency where we offer a high-quality network of advanced students to solve your challenges faster, better, in a creative manner, and cost-effectively. Before we jump into our solution, let's first take a look at some of the problems Africa is facing and as well as Rwanda. The youth are struggling to find employment due to the lack of soft skills, opportunities, and job readiness. The businesses are struggling to find the right talent, enable growth, and as well as innovation. Bag innovation, we do not see that youth development and business development have to necessarily be two different entities. Rather, we found a sweet spot where we can easily combine this together and offer high quality services to the businesses and as well as impact the young people of Rwanda. Bag Innovation enables the students to become an asset to the company. As I mentioned, Bag Innovation, we are a youth consultancy agency. Our initial service and main service is called the Youth Consulting, where we train university students to become consultants and we place them with a partner company to solve a specific challenge. As you can see here, a short example is one of our clients came to us and had a simple question. How can we sell more water to our franchises in Rwanda? We engage, with only one case, we've managed to engage over 100 students from different backgrounds and different universities to come up with innovative solutions that the company started implementing afterwards. As you can see here, 90% of our clients that use the youth consultants, they easily jump into what we call the talent placement, where we can easily offer young, talented people to companies that are looking for young, talented people. As you, um, as you can see on the slide, it says our profit margin are right now 46%. Bag Innovation is already running, and we are right now offering team from Rwanda. In just one year, we have, been, we have trained 2,000 students. Out of those 2,000, 600 graduated as bag innovators, whereby now they can consult on different company challenges. We've worked with 60 companies here in Rwanda, and 100 of our students who have been recruited to those companies. We've made a revenue of 11.5 million Rwandan francs, and we also got a Best Innovation Award in the 2017 PSF Expo. We want to be able to expand to East African countries and other countries in the future. So we want to create offices in other countries in East Africa and also come up with, uh, create a bag uh, web application, which is mobile, that will be inter interface between companies and people from different countries, students from different countries, whereby companies will be able to submit a challenge on that application, and then solution will be given from different countries, and then they'll also be able to pay and so pay a subscription fee on that application. So that will create a cross-border solution to the consultancy that we are giving, and also growth to the youth, not only here in Rwanda, in East Africa, and in other countries in Africa. As we say, bag innovation cannot exist without the competition. They're already playing actors on the market. Uh, 
who are really successful, like companies like Akazika knows they're working with youth development in Rwanda, as well as uh, companies like Inhomoko working with business development. But as I mentioned before, we found a sweet spot where we can easily combine this together, impact the young people, as well as provide high quality services to the companies all over Rwanda. Our team is composed of a multidisciplinary team with several years of experience in consulting, business development, and as well as student incubation. Our managing director, as you can see, several years of experience working with European students in Sweden, and as well as the rest of our team, as well as our quality control manager working with making sure our clients are satisfied with the solutions that the students provide. So I ju just as I, I said, we've been operating for just one year, and we used our self funds of 800,000 Rwandan francs. And out of those in six months, we were able to get a revenue of 7.5 million Rwandan francs. And we want to be able to double that revenue every single year out of our self funds. So with investment, we'll be able to go higher and actually implement even our goals that we have in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, here we're asking for 100,000 US dollars to be able to expand this model because we know that this model is working in Rwanda. We are impacting many young people with the few resources that we have. We are asking this money to be able to take this, uh, to take this to East African countries and be able to access more talent and as well as contribute to the, not only the growth of companies and SMEs all over, uh, all over East Africa, but as well as help these young people create jobs. Thank you. I, lo I love the energy. Um, you're a good tag team together. Uh, gorillas, Eugene. How do you make money? Thank you very much. Uh, we make money by offering our service, uh, which is called the youth consulting, our initial service to our companies. We, uh, for a service fee of between 100,000 Rwandan francs and 500,000 Rwandan francs. And um, what's the value of your business today? Is it a million dollar? Well, we, 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 haven't, we haven't really uh, studied uh, the evaluation since we've been operating uh, soon a year right now. Yeah, because if you're requesting $100,000 for 10%, Oops. that means your business value is about a million. Is that correct? Or it's too ambitious? Yes, or uh, as uh, my colleague uh, mentioned in the projections, we're projecting to be making uh, over $50,000 a year by, uh, by in, in just two years. So basically, our business will be more valuable with the investment that we will get from uh, you, probably. What do you think if I put on the table $20,000? Sorry? Yes, twenty. dollars Twenty thousand dollars. Yes. Is and good enough for you, for me to be part of your company. And what would be the return that you would expect from the, that? I have to look at your business plan. We can Sounds very interesting. We can talk and, about uh, it later. On top of that, I give you free adverts on my medias. Sorry. I gave. I give you a free advertisement, which means the thirty percent you're planning to spend on advertisement, you can get it for free on my, my media, TV and radio. Definitely interested. <laughs> I'm definitely interested. Okay, think about it. If it's okay, we're in business. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I'll leave it to my elder brother here to do business with you, but keep it up. Thank you. I also want to say congratulations, and we've had the, the pleasure of working together uh, and have used your, used your services. Um, two, two questions, and, and it goes, I'm going to ask the same question as I asked one of the first presenters in terms of the def definition of your model, because you talk about uh, working with as consultants, um, but you've also placed, you spoke about youth unemployment, and you're placing uh, students into uh, into businesses as that graduates 
Now, once they've graduated, graduated, they are then being absorbed, or are they getting hired as students uh, by the businesses? Uh, so, uh, the, the students that we place into the companies are fresh graduates from universities. So, we not, not only we work with uh, students that are studying university, but we also work with graduates, fresh graduates uh, from universities. So, those are the ones that are more employable than, uh, rather than uh, the university students, because our talent placement is focused on entry level. And most of the companies that are hiring these young people want a person who can work full time. So which is why we place uh, the fresh graduates. Okay, and how's the, what does the revenue model looks like, look like from, the, uh, from the, the placement, your placements model? Yes, so for the placement, a company pay a fixed, uh, fixed fee, which is 100,000 uh, Rwandan francs. And that is paid after a, a recruitment has been successful. So we provide um, a, a guarantee for the companies. So basically, wh when a company comes to us and say, I'm looking for a person in this specific area that you are working in, we can easily place the person within uh, one or two weeks into the company. Once they start working into the company for a period of one month, and the employer is satisfied with the person and would like to continue working with them, and that's when the company pays the 100,000 Rwandan francs. So I'm just, uh, once again, I, and, and w that was my, was my dilemma in terms of uh, understanding the, the, that, that business model. I know you've got an offer, um, but I want to use this as an opportunity for, for us to uh, perhaps learn or, or, and, uh, from, this, uh, from this experience. Um, just trying to understand, so you've got the consultancy and you've got the, the, the placing. Is the consultancy not providing youth training in terms of what companies are looking for, uh, which makes them more employable when they come through the bag, your bag process. Yes, uh, so the youth consultancy is our main service. So every student before uh, being, uh, getting into our database have to go through the consultancy where they work with a company challenge. W part of the reason why bag innovation was started was because there is a lack of uh, soft skills, as, as we mentioned. The students, the graduating students from universities lack sk skills like problem solving, critical thinking, and design thinking. The university system is not equipping these young people with. And if you go on the market and you do research, you will find that all the companies are specifically looking for this talent. Can you solve a problem in my company? That's what I'm looking for, right? So bag innovation, we are trying to create a new generation of problem solvers. I love the concept. I think they deserved more, uh, more enthusiastic support uh, in terms of... Uh, <laughs> and, and I think that's the, that's the key here, is, is in terms of because I, as an employer, uh, we employ a lot of uh, young people, and we do... Ex that's exactly the gap that we find, is the skills gap between graduating students and what the company actually requires and those uh, fulfilling that need. And I think if you focus a lot more on that, you have a very successful model because you've, uh, having worked with you, energetic, etc., but spending time with companies and then having a look at what they get, they get an opportunity to go work in a company without, I can give three, four, five internships a year. I can't work for 15 people, but if we employ a company like yourself, we can give 15 people an insight into what a company is doing. So I like that, and I congratulate you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy that we're doing a deal in Rwanda as well. Uh, well done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Gorillas. Wow, that was intense. That was intense. Young people, young innovators, young entrepreneurs were pitching their business ideas to those investors. Did they convince you? Well, we don't know. But next time, maybe it will be you. So, Gorillas, I know your time is very precious, but a summit like this is a lifetime opportunity. We have a young lady from Guinea Conakry. She was forced into marriage at the age of 14, and she had two children. But that didn't discourage her from dreaming big and helping other people. So, gorillas, if you may, she wants to pitch her business idea to you. Thank you.
Bonjour tout le monde. Je suis Maria Mohamed Keta, jeune entrepreneur social, qui évolue dans le cadre du recyclage des déchets plastiques en pavé et en briques. Je suis aussi la promotrice de l'entreprise Binedu Global Service. Je suis venue ici vous raconter mon histoire. Je n'ai pas eu la chance d'étudier à cause de mes parents qui m'ont donné un mariage à l'âge de 14 ans. J'étais tellement petite. J'ai eu des enfants. Ma, ma première fille, elle a 6 ans et quelques maintenant. Maintenant, après le mariage, j'avais des enfants avec moi. Je ne savais pas quoi faire. Je n'ai pas étudié. J'ai des enfants avec moi. Je dois aussi élever les enfants. Je me suis mariée avec un homme polygame qui avait une autre femme avec lui à la maison. Un jour, j'étais assise dans ma chambre. J'ai commencé à pleurer. Je me suis dit, regarde mon pays, la Guinée. Comment mon pays est très sale. Regardez la population de ma Guinée. Est-ce que je ne peux pas faire quelque chose pour mon pays? Est-ce que je ne peux pas aussi participer au développement de mon pays? C'est à travers cette réflexion que j'ai trouvé euh, la réponse de, mon, de, ma, de ma question. En fait. Je me suis demandé est-ce que où je peux trouver quelqu'un qui peut m'aider à mettre mon idée en place? Maintenant, j'ai suivi une formation avec l'entreprise Oser Innover qui m'a permis de savoir qu'une frustration peut être une opportunité d'affaires. Et j'ai vu, des... vu c'est là-bas que j'ai vu des frustrations dans mon pays. Mon pays qu'on a créé, c'est un pays qui est très, très sale, qui n'est pas comme Kigali. Et j'aimerais être... j'aimerais voir aussi mon pays comme Kigali. Il y a des déchets plastiques partout. Il y a des déchets plastiques partout qui sont pollués dans les rues. L'environnement est très sale. J'ai eu maintenant l'idée de ramasser ces déchets plastiques dans les rues, les recycler pour en faire des pavés et des briques, pour aussi participer au développement de mon pays. Si vous me voyez devant vous ici, c'est pour dire aux femmes qui ont eu cette douleur comme moi, de ne pas baisser la main, d'avoir le courage. Même si on n'a pas étudié aussi, on peut aller en avant. Je ne suis pas là pour chercher des financements, mais je suis là pour avoir des accompagnements techniques. Parce que j'ai déjà mis mon entreprise en place, mais je n'ai pas de moyens pour aller en avant. Je veux des, des, des investisseurs techniques, des stratégies pour, pour me donner aussi des conseils à recruter beaucoup de femmes qui ont déjà suivi les mêmes choses que moi. Et je dirais aux femmes aussi qui sont dans les villages. Parce qu'un jour, je n'ai pas connu la richesse. Je suis née dans la pauvreté, grandir dans la pauvreté. Même si on est pauvre, on peut aussi participer au développement de son pays. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for this uh, touching sharing. Um, how can we help you? What are you looking from us? Thank you. Now, can you hear me? S'il vous plaît, reprenez votre question. Oui. Thank you for the sharing. Um, how can we help? What are you looking? What is your ask from the gorillas? Uh, ici, moi, je recherche uh, une aide. C'est pas financier, mais aussi technique pour m'aider, pour avoir non seulement des conseils, mais aussi. Euh, m'aider aussi à mettre mon entreprise en place, faire grandir mon entreprise, et pour, pour que aussi moi aussi je puisse euh, recruter beaucoup de femmes.
qui, sont, qui, qui ont subi le même problème que moi. Emre, you're building a leadership institution. Can you help? Je voudrais commencer par vous dire uh, félicitations. Et je voudrais demander à toutes les personnes ici présentes de vous applaudir très, très fort. Merci beaucoup. Ça, ça prend beaucoup de courage d'avoir traversé ce que vous avez traversé et d'être ici parmi nous, parler devant des milliers de personnes de votre histoire et en venant de, de loin. Ça, ça mérite déjà que vous sachiez que vous avez déjà fait la moitié du chemin. Et en ce qui concerne l'autre moitié, vous avez raison, peut-être que l'argent n'est pas le, la première chose, mais une forme d'accompagnement euh, au niveau de l'éducation, au niveau même de l'apprentissage du milieu des affaires peut vous être utile. Alors, je, je, voudrais, je voudrais vous proposer ceci. Comme Yari vient de le mentionner, en partenariat avec euh, d'autres investisseurs des États-Unis, nous sommes en train de commencer un institut de leadership et d'entrepreneurship pour encourager des jeunes qui veulent s'en sortir et faire des affaires. Et je pense que vous répondez totalement à tous les critères. Je voudrais qu'on ait une occasion d'en discuter. Je voudrais qu'on ait l'occasion d'en discuter amplement. Et je pense aussi à une autre organisation. Je dois juste vérifier si elle est présente dans votre pays. C'est une organisation internationale et qui donne des experts pour des courtes durées. Euh, il y a quelques années, je les ai représentés au Rwanda. Je dois juste vérifier s'ils sont présents dans votre pays. Et si tel est le cas, je pense que cette organisation aussi, euh, avec notre recommandation, pourra faire quelque chose. Je, je voudrais terminer par vous dire un grand merci, parce que partager votre vulnérabilité avec une grande audience comme ça, c'est un moment intense. Je pense que ça vous coûte émotionnellement, mais je veux vous dire aussi que nous avons apprécié votre générosité de cœur. Et c'est ça la plus grande force, même dans le milieu des affaires, qui va vous faire réussir. Merci, et on va parler encore tout à l'heure. Thank you so much, Gorillas. I think we are done. This was not planned. Mariam Keita, thank you so much. She's from Guinea Conakry. This was not planned. It's, uh, she just took the opportunity. She grabbed that opportunity. It could have been you, but then next time maybe you'll try. So thank you so much, Gorillas. Let's proceed with uh, the other part of our session. So young entrepreneurs and innovators just pitched their business ideas. Is it enough? Is having a business, an idea, and money, is it enough to have a successful business? Well, that's what our next speaker is going to talk about. He's an expert in media, in public relations, in marketing. He's an award-winning entrepreneur, CEO of Dicero Media, His name is Tebrojo Di Cero. Welcome, sir. Maramote. I'm from South Africa. My name is Tebrojo Di Cero. I'm the CEO of Di Cero Media. And I'm very excited to be in Rwanda. I actually landed on Saturday at around eight in the morning. And the first thing I said was Maramote. Amakuru? Murakoze. <laughs> 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 
Help me here. Nishimye Kuza Murwanda Nziza. And for my brothers and sisters from Kenya and East Africa, Habariako. Mzuri sana. So, I started a company called Ditejo Media in South Africa. And I want us to continue the conversation on social media. You can follow me at Tebojo Ditejo. I know the spelling is a bit different in South Africa. Ditejo is D-I-T-S-H-E-G-O. So it's Tebojo Ditejo on social media. I also want us to make YCA 2018 trend. So let's tweet and talk about our experiences here using the hashtag YCA 2018. Now, why I'm excited to be in Rwanda is because where there are challenges, there are opportunities. It's actually the same reason I'm very excited to be from South Africa because we do have many challenges. Africa as a whole has a lot of challenges. How many of you know what the gross domestic product of Africa combined is? Raise your hands. R you don't know. Do you know the gross domestic product of Africa? You don't know. It's $3 trillion, $3.5 trillion. Now, to put that into perspective, the gross domestic product of Germany alone is $3.6 trillion. So that's higher than Africa combined. Now, we may see that as a curse, but I see that as, an, as a blessing because we are not going to be what we were yesterday. I think the future for Africa is very bright. But it starts with us, and I think we should remember what the young man from Nigeria said. There was a young man who was seated over there. And he said that to travel from Nigeria to some African countries is like traveling to the moon. They ask you questions after questions. You apply and you pray that you'll get a visa and sometimes your prayers are not answered. Traveling from one place to the next as an African should not require prayer. All you need is a passport. And it's good that in East Africa, in some instances, all you need is your ID. And I think we should give a round of applause to Rwanda. Because I landed in Rwanda at quarter past eight on Saturday, 20 past eight, I had crossed the border without no visa. So Rwanda is leading by example in breaking down the borders that are holding Africa back. I have a very special announcement for you. This is the first time that I'm announcing this in public. Ditejo Media is a leading public relations agency in South Africa. And in 2019, we are going to open our first office in Kigali, Rwanda. Now, my journey as an entrepreneur started in Kahiso. Kahiso is a township in South Africa. I don't know if anyone, any one of you are from Nyamirambu. <laughs> oh, you think I don't know Rwanda, ne? Nyamirambo is similar to Kahiso. So I didn't grow up in an area where we were rich. My family was not rich. My family was not politically connected. We did not grow up in a big household. In fact, in South Africa, we had things called four-roomed houses that we got from the apartheid regime. Now, in a four-roomed house, you've got a dining room, You've got a kitchen, and you have two bedrooms, four. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, where's the toilet? <laughs> outside. You have to walk outside to go to the toilet. So that is how I grew up in Kahiso. 
And growing up in Kajiso was not easy, but what my parents did is they invested in my education. They couldn't afford the education that I had, so at some point, my high school came to repossess the fridge that we had. You can imagine you're in poverty and they're repossessing the last piece of furniture that you have. But that didn't stop me. In high school, one of my teachers said that I have the gift of public speaking, so I should enter the speech competition. So what I decided to do is to enter the speech competition and after winning a few times in high school, I decided to invest in those natural talents. And I think that is the first lesson that I want to leave with young entrepreneurs. Sometimes people say that you should follow your passion. But I say, follow your talents. Develop a passion for that. Invest in that until you're an expert so that you can make money. So I studied public relations at the University of Johannesburg. Obviously, going out from Cajiso into Johannesburg, my environment changed. I had a better environment. Nutrition was better. My conditions were better. So I could perform much better. I was one of the top in my class, graduated. I did a postgraduate degree. But while I was studying, I was writing articles for newspapers in South Africa. So I was building my network, putting my name out there. And on top of that, I was elected into the Student Representative Council. So the lesson I want you to take from that is invest in your talents through education. Number two, go the extra mile. Because going the extra mile is what differentiates you from your competition. After studying, I went into the industry and I started to work so that I can get experience, so that I can understand the public relations industry. And that helped me because I then understood, okay, this is how you can build the reputation of an organization. Young entrepreneurs, I want you to remember this. A business has tangible and intangible assets. One tangible asset would be your working capital, which I know that a lot of us would struggle to find. And that's why we should commend what was happening here because it's very difficult to get capital for your business. But there's something that you can start working on now without a huge investment, and that is your intangible assets. Now, one of your greatest assets as an entrepreneur that you can build is credibility. Credibility. So as a public relations specialist, my job is to communicate on behalf of an organization in a strategic fashion that will ensure that I build the reputation of the business, maintain and sustain its credibility. Now, how can you as a young entrepreneur build your credibility? It's simple. If you make a promise, keep it. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. It's better to underpromise and overdeliver. So you're building your credibility. How do you do that? It would depend. But I think generally, no matter what industry you're in, you want to be a thought leader. What does that mean? You want to be the go-to person. They ask for advice in a specific industry. So a thought leader is someone who's an expert, but they are ahead of their generation in that they go the extra mile, they're innovative, and they are out there. So they go to you when they need a trusted opinion. So you must be a thought leader. 
and that goes back to investing in education. But I think it also goes beyond formal education. I think we need to also address the culture of reading books in Africa. Your formal education system will not teach you what you should know. It will teach you how to learn. What you should know is up to you. You must go and do the research. So I think going over and above that, you must know what is happening in your industry, which means you must read and you must do research. And when you do that, you then become an expert and the trusted source for information. Are you with me? Murakoze. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> let's look at Rwanda. Let's use Rwanda as a source of inspiration. Rwanda, unlike South Africa, may not be rich of natural resources. It may not have had the head start of development in terms of industrialization. But Rwanda has this, the intellectual resource which is unlimited. Let me tell you how. You may not have natural resources, but security is a resource that you developed by yourself. And that's why I said a business has tangible and intangible assets. Intangible assets are limitless. So when Rwanda says, when you come to my country, you can walk at 10 p.m. holding your cell phone. No one is going to do anything to you. That is an intangible asset, security. And that is something that you can build in your business, intangible asset of being a thought leader, being the one that we can trust for that information. Are you with me? Another intangible asset that Rwanda has is a zero tolerance to corruption and public sector efficiency. So when you want to register a company, it will take you, can take you a few hours to register in, in Rwanda. But in some other African countries, you'd be lucky if you can register it within seven days. Now you need to think about that because what I'm talking about is value added assets, intangible assets. So ask yourself in your business, what can you do to add value to the next client? How can you meet and surpass the expectations of the next client? Think of it in that way. Now, one of the other things that is very important is networking. When you're trying to build your business and you need clients and you need customers, you're going to need a strong network. <clears throat> but what if you don't have a network. What if your family is not connected? Ladies and gentlemen, if that's the case, then you're just like me. You see, when I started Ditejo Media in 2011, I didn't have a network. I had an education. I had experience. When I started Ditejo Media in 2011, I also did not have capital. In dollars, I had about $800 in my bank account. $800 in 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to tell you a fairy tale. Within four months of being in business, I already had to start selling my assets. I already had to start renting out my car. I read, and assets, I mean, whatever furniture was in the house, I had to sell it so that the business can run. And the business collapsed, and there's something in South Africa we call unemployment insurance fund. I had to go and apply for that. I had to go back in the industry, get more capital, and come back. Now, why did the business fail? Because we had one email which we sent to all clients. 
That is one of the biggest mistakes that most organizations make. Because if you're sending one email to each and every client, it means you didn't care to do research about that specific client. One of the reasons our slogan is tailor-made solutions. Tailor-made solutions was how we resolved our business challenges. So what we did is we said we're no longer going to send the same email to every client. Now we are going to do research on you. We're going to research the specific business. We're going to look at the gaps. And then we're going to find out how can we resolve the gaps in our industry, which is the communications business. As soon as we started to do that, we started to see more clients responding. So instead of saying, what can you do for me? The question became, what can I do for you? That might be one of the most important points that I will leave you with today. If you are starting a marketing campaign, understand your target audience. You must understand what they eat. You must understand the radio stations they listen to. You must know their opinions. You must know what they're happy about, what they're not happy about. You must know what they think is cool. You must know who they look up to. Because when you have that information, you will be able to know, how do I communicate to this target audience? So the biggest mistake that the Tejo Media would do when we start to do business in Rwanda is to take solutions from South Africa and try to implement them in Rwanda. Rwanda needs Rwandan solutions. And another big mistake that we could make is coming from South Africa to Rwanda and bringing 80% South African employees. The majority of the Ditejo Media employees in Rwanda will be people from Rwanda. <laughs> and it's not a favor. <clears throat> you must know, this is not a favor. It's not doing a favor. I'm doing myself a favor. Because if you work with the people of Rwanda, they understand the market in Rwanda. And therefore, your business is more likely to be successful. But if you come with your international arrogance in Rwanda, it will be very difficult for you to penetrate the market. So after failing, I went back into business 2012 with a new approach, tailor-made solutions. We got our first client. We got our second client. 2013, we started to grow. We started to organize World Book Day. 2012, we registered Read a Book Essay on Twitter. Everybody should follow it. Read a Book Essay is our corporate social investment. It's the biggest online book club on the African continent. In 2014, people started to see that Ditejo Media is growing. And on the 6th of February 2014, I was listed as one of the top 30 African entrepreneurs under the age of 30 by Forbes magazine. In 2012, I was invited to the United States of America and I got a certificate signed by the first African American president of the United States, President Barack Obama. And over the period of time from that success, I've met over